you when I'm grieving. Praise you every season of the soul. If they could see how much you're worth, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely they will never cease to pray. Oh 
His mercy, I've been spared. It's not by works, my faith in Him who called. For so long I've been hindered. For so long I've been stoned. I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. Somebody help me see. Save. Lift your voice. Save. By his mercy, I've been spared. It's not by works, by faith in him who called. For so long I've been hindered. For so long I've been stoned. I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. Come on, sing. Saved by the blood of the Lamb. Well, I went to 
Jesus, 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 friend for sing the name of the Lord.
sing. Come on. Jesus. 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 Friend forever. One more time. Sing.
significant for Jesus Christ. It's time for us to take our homes back from the devil. It's time for us to start impacting our world. It's time, time for us to stand up as honor-bound men, making a difference in our workplaces, in our homes, in our churches, around this world. Amen? Whoa, glory, glory, glory. Praise God. I'm so humbled. You know, in my previous career, I kind of blended into the walls and had those dark glasses and had a little thing coming out of my ear and spoke into my hand a lot. The anointing of God is so good. Hey, Amen. I'd rather give my life for Christ any day, amen? Yeah. I'm so honored to be here tonight, standing before you, standing before you with Brother Kilpatrick and Brother Trask here. And uh, I just wanted to greet you tonight and say, man, are we having a good time or what? Yeah? yeah? We've seen lives changed in a day and a half, or a day, or however long it's been. It feels like a year. But we have seen lives changed right here at this altar. In fact, so many, ho, oh, tomorrow night we're going to have 17 men baptized that have been born again at this conference. Amen? Brother Kilpatrick, last Christmas, was so kind to offer to host this first National Honor Bound Men's Conference. I told him I wanted to come home, but I also wanted to come where so many souls have been saved when I launched the Reach 3 Challenge for prayer and evangelism with the men of this fellowship. I told him I wanted to be right where I felt God is going to birth a tidal wave out of here. Taking our country back for Jesus. Having men stand up at the altars ahead of the women having men's lives changed right before our eyes because we as men start building relationships with other men and making a difference in our own communities, making ourselves lighthouses for Jesus. And Brother Kilpatrick, I can't tell you how much you've blessed Honor Bound and me personally. Uh, he's just such a humble man. I, I, I you know, I just love him so much, and I just want to turn it over to him before I make a fool out of myself. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you so much. <clears throat> you may be seated. <laughs> Boy, it'd be easy to preach in this place, I can tell you. <laughs> no, no, no. It's my privilege tonight to have the opportunity to introduce to you in just a moment our guest speaker. But before I do, I wanted to um, bring greetings to you on behalf of all of our people here from Brownsville Assembly and let you know how thrilled we are to have you. This 
This, I believe, is going to be a powerful men's convention. This is an hour when God is moving in unusual ways. And friend, I have seen a lot of men and families stuck, not knowing what to do, not knowing where to go, wanting God, reaching out for God, but yet at the same time bound. But I'm here to tell you that when the tide comes in, it lifts all boats. And the tide of the Spirit of God is beginning to move in these days, and God is lifting all denominations, men, women, young people, and children. I remember on Father's Day of 1995 when the Spirit of God broke out in this church. It was the most remarkable day of my whole life because as I walked across this platform that day, I didn't realize in a matter of seconds that this whole church, my life, my ministry, this city, was going to change in a matter of seconds. I did not know. I knew God had told me he was going to pour out his spirit and that revival was going to come to Brownsville, but I did not dream that it was going to happen on Father's Day of 1995. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a cute little story before I move on. <clears throat> the morning of Father's Day, well, the night before, my wife and I had met with Steve Hill, and we met at a restaurant here in Pensacola, and my wife had been touched by God, and, and Steve had been mildly touched by God, but I'd been staying with my mother, and she was in a dying condition for several months, from November until she died May the 7th. As a matter of fact, just a few weeks ago was the fourth anniversary of her death. And when I met with Steve Hill on Friday night, on Saturday night, my wife and I, they were so excited about God. They was they was chatting back and forth, you know, just talking, and they were, had great expectancy about what God was about to do in the world. And although we'd been praying for two and a half years for revival, I didn't know that God was going to do it the next morning. And uh, I was sitting there listening to them talk, and my heart was jealous because, like I said, I'd had to stay with my mother in her dying condition. And... Um, so whenever I listened to them talk, I just became so jealous and so hungry for God because they'd been touched, and I just hadn't been touched. And I had five weeks to grieve after my mother died. My mother was a very important person in my life, and God gave me five weeks to grieve after her death. When I woke up that morning, on Sunday morning, it was Father's Day, I didn't want to come to church that morning. I didn't want to come. As a matter of fact, I'd asked Steve on that Saturday night, I said, why don't you just preach tomorrow morning? He was supposed to preach on Father's Day night. And I said, why don't you just preach tomorrow morning? And he said, okay. And usually I don't turn my pulpit to over to anybody like that, especially on a special day and like Father's Day. And when I woke up that morning, I thought, well, I've got a guest speaker this morning. I don't think I'm going to go because I just don't feel like going today. I've still felt heavy over the loss of my mother and, and other things going on too I won't get into. But I remember... I was reaching for the telephone to call one of my board members, and he's here tonight. I was going to reach over to the telephone and call him and just say, hey, I'm not going to be there this morning. Just have Steve go ahead with the service. But then as I was reaching for the telephone to call this man, my mind, in my mind's eye, I remembered it was Father's Day, and I remembered at the first of every year in January at our department heads meeting, we vote in a mother of the year and a father of the year. And we give them their special recognition on Mother's Day and Father's Day. And I remember on Father's Day, which was going to be, well, which was that morning, I remember I had to present a plaque to the father of the year, and he was a single father, and his wife had left him for another man, but he was raising his daughter by himself, and she was a beautiful little girl. She was about that high, and she dearly loved me as her pastor. As a matter of fact, She'd come up to me a lot of times when I'd get through preaching and she'd wrap her arms around my legs and she'd look up at me and she'd say, I love you, preacher. <laughs> and that morning when I was reaching over for the telephone to call and say I wasn't coming, I remember seeing her little face look up at me and saying, I love you, preacher. And I said to myself, well, I'm going to get up and go on. And I come here this, that Father's Day morning. What I'm trying to talk to you about right now is I'm trying to talk to you about divine appointments. Divine appointments. I believe God's got a divine appointment for his people in these last days. 
I was preaching here at Brownsville last Sunday, and I was preaching about God's suddenlies. And uh, the Bible said on the day of Pentecost when the church was founded, the Bible said in Acts 2 and 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. The Bible said that the church was birthed suddenly, and the Bible said when the church is taken out, it'll be taken out in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, suddenly. Well, I want to ask you something. If God let the church be born suddenly and he's going to take it out suddenly, doesn't it make sense that he's got some suddenlies in between? I believe God's got some unexpected things in store for his people in these last days. And friend, it can happen, it can happen suddenly. Something you did not anticipate, an encounter with God. And I remember that morning when Steve got up to preach, he was just beside himself. And he was standing up here behind this pulpit and he was just prancing from leg to leg like this while he was preaching. He just couldn't be still. And he kept saying, in just a moment, I'm going to pray for you, and God's going to mightily touch you. And he'd preach on a little bit longer, and he'd say, in just a moment, I'm going to pray for you, and God's going to mightily touch you. And he'd prance, you know, and he just couldn't be still. And I thought to myself, after the second or third time he said that, I thought, okay, okay, got you, got you. God's going to mightily touch us. Okay, got you. And I remember he preached on a little bit longer. I don't even remember what he preached that morning. But uh, he kept saying that over and over again. And I was, I was upset. I just, I wasn't in the mood, you know. I was expecting revival, but not that day. And I remember when I got up from my chair that morning, well, Steve, as soon as he got through preaching, he said, if you want prayer, come forward, hurry, come, come. And I remember out of about 1,800 people present that morning, about 1,000 people lunged forward for prayer. And there was about 800 left out in the pews. And I thought to myself, sitting over there in my chair, I thought to myself, gee whiz, it's Father's Day. <laughs> and we got to pray for a thousand people this morning. Man. And I said to myself, boy. Little did I know we was going to have lunch with Father that day. And I thought to myself, <laughs> I thought to myself, you know, the least you could do, Steve, is just come, tell them to come back tonight. We'll pray for them tonight. You ought to let them go on, go on home and have lunch with their daddies today. And so in just a few minutes when all those people lunched forward, Steve jumped off the platform, and he went over here in this area of the church, and he started praying for people. And I was sitting there in my chair, and I thought to myself, oh, man, I got to go help him. <laughs> you know, I was in a bad mood. I didn't want, and Steve was like a gazelle. You know, he just danced. <laughs> he just danced off the platform. He just danced off the platform. And I got up in a few minutes, and I thought, well, I guess I better go help him. What will people think? I'm just sitting here, and he's out there praying for everybody. And I got up out of my chair, and you could tell, man, I mean, I was heavy. And I got up out of my chair and walked across the platform, and I know I was walking across the platform like this. You know? And here he was out here praying for people, and there's this big guy. <clears throat> he was about right here. And there was this big guy Steve was praying for. He was taller than I am, big fellow. And I remember I was standing about right in this area, and I had my hand on Steve's back. I put my hand on his back, and I put my hand on this guy's shoulder that he was praying for and all of a sudden friend it sounded like a rushing mighty wind came in this place <sighs> just a rushing mighty wind and I heard it and I thought to myself what is wrong with the sound system <laughs> you know and I looked up there at the speaker cluster right up above the pulpit and I thought what is that noise and I'm standing over here and then right behind me this noise comes, and I could tell it wasn't coming from up there, it was coming from over here. And as I'm standing there, and I got my hand still on Steve's back, this, all of a sudden, it just starts coming in from the back of my legs like an endless telephone pole. And it felt like a wind, but I learned later it was the river of the glory of God. And friend, it was the most awesome experience 
that I think you could ever experience, to feel. I never felt the presence of God like that in my life. I never dreamed it was possible to feel his presence that strong, and I never dreamed it was possible to feel his presence consistently over these last four years, night after night, in this church. And I remember I made my way back up to the platform, and I leaned up on the pulpit right here. I barely could stand up. And when I leaned up on the pulpit, I talked to the congregation for just a few moments. And all of a sudden, now I'm in it, you know. I'm not depressed anymore. I'm not heavy anymore. Now, I've, you know, praise God, God touched me, you know. Hey, let's get with it, folks. Come on, what's wrong with you? You know. And I leaned up on the pulpit. I could barely stand up. And I said to the congregation, I said, this is it. This is what we've been praying for. Get in. And man, when I said that, like the federal headship of the church, you know, the pastor giving his permission, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what it was. But when I said that, get in, this is it. It came in this place like a rushing river. You couldn't see it, but you could feel the presence of God. I'm telling you folks, it came in and the power of God hit. I hit the platform. Nobody ever touched me. And I hit the platform and I lay there for four hours under the power of God. I could hear everything. But I just couldn't move. I couldn't get up off the platform. I could hear everything. But when I hit that platform, I hit so hard, my head bounced on that marble floor. My head just bounced on that marble floor. And I thought, dear God, what is this? And the Lord just spoke to my heart, and he said, this is that. This is what you've been praying for. This is it. Friend, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. God is not a sadist. If he prepares a table, he will let you eat at that table. If you pray for revival, if you pray for a move of the Holy Spirit, God won't just give you the unction and the desire for revival. He will satisfy that desire. This is an hour of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Get in and let God bless you. Get in and let God pour out his spirit upon you. I want to say that whenever a revival broke out on Father's Day that morning in this church, that was just one, this church is just one of many churches in the world where God is moving by his spirit. God will move wherever we will let him move. And I want to tell you, God has women. God can touch them. They're sensitive to the Holy Spirit. God loves to bless and to touch his women. But there's something about it when God's men get hungry and start going after God, there's something about that that really excites the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you something. There's enough men here tonight that if you would let God mightily touch your life, just take the guard down, let your umbrella down, and have a divine encounter with the Holy God there's enough men here that can go out and touch this nation from coast to coast and border to border, and God can do a powerful work in America. And I want to say this. Tonight it is with a great deal of pleasure that I have the opportunity to come before you and introduce our speaker for the night. I, I really, truly believe that God had Thomas Trask in the position as general superintendent for this hour. He is a man called by God, ordained by God, to be in that position in our generation. God has placed him there, there's no doubt in my mind. And I believe that he was there when this revival broke out because he has been extremely friendly toward this move of God he has tried to accommodate us every way he possibly could. He's been there to give wisdom. He's been there to give godly insight, godly counsel. His friendship and his leadership to us here at Brownsville has been invaluable. And not only is he a great leader, but he's a great preacher of the word. You're in for a treat. Would you please welcome General Superintendent Thomas Trass. Thank you so very much. You may be seated.
powerful. Let me, uh, let me take a few minutes because it is right and needful and proper. First of all, I want to express appreciation to Charles Brewster and his team for putting together this conference, the first ever for men of the Assemblies of God. And it is in the timing of God, without a question. Charles, I want to say thank you. You and your team, where's uh, Jeff and others who but men, the leadership, thank you, yes. Thank, would you show your appreciation to them? Thank you. Sir. Sir. Thank you so very much. We have um, leadership of this church here, district superintendents. I'm going to ask them to stand. Robert Crabtree from the great state of Ohio. <laughs> Superintendent Glenn Cole from Northern Cal, Nevada district. Bless you, Glenn Cole. Pastors, evangelists, all these, all you fellows up there stand, would you? Go ahead. Sure. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Good. Wonderful. Now, let me tell you something. God has used and is using Brownsville as the fountainhead for revival across this fellowship. And um, I can't tell you how thrilled and pleased I am. Now, I must tell you there's some aren't pleased with me, but that's okay. That's not important. What's important is that we are in step with, where, with what God is doing. You see, we don't ask God to bless what we're doing. We find out what God is blessing and do what he's doing. That's the key. And uh, I can't tell you how many pastors and churches have visited Brownsville and have been touched by the Spirit of God. And the Assemblies of God today is being changed by the power of the Holy Spirit because men, pastors, and laity alike are hungry for God. Now let me help you men. Here's how you can help this church. When you return home, sit down with your pastor and say, Pastor, look, I want to help you pray for revival for our church. Would you do that? Now you'll never get the crowd. you never get the crowd in prayer. I mean, Jesus didn't have the crowd in the prayer. I mean, he got the crowd when he fed them but not in the prayer meetings. So don't expect the crowd and don't get upset when the crowd doesn't show up for a prayer meeting. But it's in the prayer meeting that makes it happen in the church. That's the, that's the engine of the church. So when you go back home after having been touched by God this week, sit down with your pastor and say, Pastor, I love you. And I want to join hands with you and join my heart with your heart to pray for revival. And whatever it takes. Now, you're not going to, this is not going to happen after a week and a half. I mean, in some cases, it's taken years to get to the place that it's in. I mean, deadness that it's there. And it takes a while for resurrection to come. So don't expect it took two and a half years. You heard what the pastor just said. Two and a half years they prayed for revival before it came to Brownsville. You see, there are those who want to shortcut this whole thing. It can't be done. And when the early church prayed, the place was shaken. Not played, prayed. There's a difference. So the greatest contribution you can make is to... Sit down with the pastor and say, Pastor, look, I love you, and I'm with you, and I'm going to believe God with you 
Because I can tell you, they're by far, far and away, the majority of the pastors want revival, want God to move. And they, many of these men and women stand alone. So I, I beg of you, I implore of you, start a prayer movement in the church. Uh, God is doing so many wonderful things. I spent um, uh, an hour every month with men on the phone, a prayer conference phone, with men such as Bill Bright, Campus Crusade for Christ. There was a day that Bill Bright wouldn't touch Pentecost. And what God has done, and with uh, some uh, a spirit-filled Methodist, United Methodist pastor, there's 10 of us, and what we do is just pray one for another, for one solid hour, um, an hour a month. Baptist, United Methodist, an Episcopalian. Now, let me tell you something. You, just, you don't do that, and that just doesn't happen. God puts that in the hearts of men. Yeah. Hallelujah. So uh, I want you to, I, I want you to be obedient to the work of the Holy Spirit. God is doing some marvelous things. I didn't know this till just the other day. The uh, Hal Donaldson, the editor of the Pentecostal Evangel, and Joel Kilpatrick, unbeknown to me, on Route 66 that goes clear across America, he sent Joel Kilpatrick to the West Coast, and Hal went to the East Coast, and they said, we will meet halfway in the middle of the United States, and we want to visit Assembly of God churches. They were just in my office a week ago. And we will visit large and small, black and white, ethnic, Hispanic, whatever, whatever flavor, whatever color. We will visit Assembly of God churches all across our way. And then they kept in touch with each other by phone. Joel came from California, and Hal started in New York. And they sat in my office just the other day and said, Brother Trask, I want you to know there's revival in the Assemblies of God. We didn't find one dead Assembly of God church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, that's unsolicited. I said, that's unsolicited. I, I was so thrilled. I said to him when we went to chapel that morning, I said, uh, you share with chapel what you just shared with me because it, it's powerful. And we haven't got there yet. Now, you will understand this. This is not good English, but you'll understand. It's going to get gooder and gooder. You know why? Because the book says so. In the last days, I will pour out of my spirit. Not sprinkle it. Pour out. Uh, my spirit, of uh, the spirit of God. You understand what that is? That's the Holy Ghost. Interesting, Pastor, you were saying you were preaching on Sunday. I was preaching in Fremont, California, First Assembly Sunday night, and I was preaching from Malachi chapter 3, and it says in verse number 1, and suddenly the Lord shall come into his temple. Somebody said, I thought there was only tithing in Malachi 3. Well, read it. It's uh, something else in Malachi 3. <laughs> God, God is up to something, church men. And he's amassing an army. I like these banners, Charles. A raising army. Not just a regiment, but an army for the kingdom of God's sake. Now let me, uh, let me share with you what God has laid upon my heart for you tonight. Go with me, please, to the book of Genesis. You say, oh, that's a dry book. No, that's where it began. Sure. Genesis chapter 1. Now, whatever you... Oh, and I'm glad to see the, the Bibles. How many got your Bible in your hands? Hold it up. That's the sword. You can cut old Slufa to ribbons with that thing. He doesn't care what you say, but brother, he's afraid of what the book says. 
David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You want to live victorious? You got to get in the book. And the book's got to live in you. And that's got out of that marvelous word comes divine life of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. Be a, read the book every day. How many read the Bible every day? Wonderful. You, can't, you have to read the Bible every day. You, it's, it's like eating. You got to eat every day to maintain your physical strength. You got to stay in the Word to maintain your physical, your spiritual strength. So, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, now whenever you read that, you need to sit up. God said, not the assemblies of God, God said. How many know there's a difference? <laughs> you better know. And God said, let us make man, not mouses, the husband and wife are having a little squabble, and she said to him, what are you, a man or a mouse? And the little kid standing by, the, by his dad's feet said, Squeak up, Daddy. <laughs> I want you to know God, God created men. A man. This silly society we got today that makes sissies sissies let me tell you as you study the word read the word this book is packed full of examples of men whom god brought to the scene for a time in the history of the world and i believe with all my heart that god is raising an army to become an army for the kingdom of god's sake in this hour in which we live Mark it down. God has always had a man. I said, God has always had a man. Read it. Study it in the Word of God. It's marvelous. Sought for a man among them. There was a man sent from God. His name was what? John. Read it in John chapter 1. God has always had a man. Now it says here that God said, let us make man in our image. Now you look at that, please. That's powerful. Let us make man in our image. After our likeness. I'm going to have you get a picture of what you are tonight. As God sees you. Not as society sees you. Or as you even, even as you see yourself. But how God views you you see because in the heart of men in the uh, after the creation of God God made man in his likeness to be what he ordained us to be you understand that let me say that again God made us after his likeness so that we might be what he wants us to be not what somebody else wants you to be. Now, the fulfillment of life and the fulfillment of joy is to live out the image that God created you for. You say, well, if I can just get my hands on money. Let me tell you, there are more unhappy people with money than anybody. So it isn't in money. It isn't in titles. It isn't in positions. It's in relationships. A relationship with God. So he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, if you'll look at that, please, that let us, that's the first mention of the Trinity in the Bible. Look at that. Let us. Who's he speaking of? He's speaking Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Powerful. 
way back here in Genesis 1, we find the Trinity. So God has put together and they had the linkage and the creative work of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I want you to know, man, that this wasn't just a whim of God. This wasn't just a snap decision. Well, I think that we need to be a creative being on the earth. We'll call a man. God said, let us make man after our likeness. Boy, that's powerful. I was studying this in the word of God. After our likeness. There it is again. That trinity after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea now i've been fishing many times i was raised in northern minnesota and my father was a pastor and i've sat by the i've sat in boats and stood on bridges and stood on banks and uh, when i was a boy and i used to pray god let these miserable things bite because we're not going home till we get some it was food back then it's true and i couldn't understand if i had dominion why they didn't respond to me <laughs> how many have been there come on yeah i know over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth verse 27 now not only did god say it but in verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him. This nonsense that you come from a tadpole. Those that believe it look like a tadpole. You know, I, I really, I don't understand how intellig intelligentsia, men that have supposedly a mental capacity that is uh, off the charts, that's maybe that's the problem, off the charts, could, could, un could believe that man came through evolution. I like what I read in the word of God. So God created, hallelujah. It took the hand of an almighty God. God formed us after his likeness. He formed you after his likeness. Not an accident. Not an happenstance. Not a freak. But we've been made in the likeness of an almighty God. You think of that. The highest form of God's creation. Whew. No wonder men, God is so concerned about the men today. It's true. No wonder God in his patience and in his tenderness deals with us and woos us and calls us and, and works within our hearts and lives. We were made in his likeness. Whew, that's enough to just absolutely boggle your mind. Verse number 28. He made, he created the he, him, male and female, not Adam and Adam and Eve and Eve. Weird bunch. I said weird bunch. This society of ours is degenerating and deteriorating so fast. Let me say something to you. If there's ever been an hour and a need for men, Holy Ghost men, Spirit-filled men, men of backbone, men of courage, men of strength, men of character, men of integrity, men of godliness. If there's ever been an hour in America's history, it's today. It's this hour. And I see the hand of an almighty God raising up an army of men that are identifying with the cross of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Now, so there's no excuse. Don't 
offer God any excuse. Well, Brother Trask, I uh, can't help what I am. You're right. You were created in his image and his likeness. Now, once I understand that, and once I settle that in my spirit man, then it becomes incumbent upon me to begin to live out the likeness of God. We well, say, I, I want to, but I don't find the strength to do it. Well, I'll get to that in a few moments, but let me, let me help you to understand, first of all, what it is and what's inside of you so that when you know of how he created you and his likeness then you know the role model you're to follow so isn't these athletics that are so strung out on drugs and messed up and we in america we make them heroes let me tell you, God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit becomes the heroes of the church of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to give you six, six factors that it's been placed in your heart, not maybe, it's in your heart. God created you. God placed it in your heart. It's inside of you. What you need to do is allow the Spirit of God to so work in your life that out of your life come these attributes that will make you what the purpose and the reason for how he created you. You understand that? Let me say that again. We're going to look at, there's more, but I'm just going to touch on six tonight. Six attributes that are inside of every man that was placed there in the creative work of God when he made you. You say, well, Brother Trask, I, uh, I am of German accent. Has no bearing on it. So am I. Well, you say, I'm of Italian, and you don't understand the Italians. I don't need to understand the Italians. I was just there and preached their general consul a couple of weeks ago. It doesn't make any difference where you go. All men were created in the likeness of God, in the image of God. So inside, inside of you, inside of me, are these attributes. If I will allow God to release them inside of me, now I will be able to live out the fulfillment for the purpose for why God created me. And that is the fullness of life. That is joy unspeakable and full of glory. The first one is this. You were created to give instruction. I said, you were created to give instruction. That's why, and when he said, I created man in our likeness, you find throughout the word of God, the word of God is a book of instructions. Now you cannot, men, you cannot forfeit that to somebody else. You cannot place that responsibility. You say, but Brother Trask, my wife is the teacher in our family. My wife is the instructor in our family. Let me tell you, God created you to be the instructor, to be the teacher. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1, And my son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they give to thee. Let no mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, while, they, while write them upon the table of thine heart. So shall thy find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father. Attend to know his understanding. He taught me also, verse 4, also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. 
the, one of the problems in America today, one of the problems in the Assembly of God Church and the American Church is that men, godly men, have not given instruction in the home. That's been, God has put that inside of you. That's in you. You say, well, I don't know how to do it. Well, then find out how to do it. Let that out of you. That's part of the creative work in the likeness of God that he created you in. Verse number 10. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in the right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall, be not, shall not be strength. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take hold, fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. God, understand this now, God created you to be a godly instructor in the home. Not maybe, fact. And if you will uh, allow the Spirit of God to come upon you, if you will live in the fullness of the Spirit of God, I promise you, man, it'll flow out of you like a river. Hallelujah. I was reading over there in the book of Acts the other day, studying the Word of God, and I was reading about Saul. Go, if you want to read a wonderful account, read it again. But it says this, after Saul's conversion, look at this, Immediately after Saul's conversion, after he received his sight with Ananias, the scripture says that he goes into the synagogues, not synagogue, synagogues, and instructs them in the way of Jesus. Now this man from conversion just a days earlier, now he's in the synagogues instructing them, teaching them, telling them, testifying of the power of Jesus Christ. Now, that shouldn't be a shock to us. God created him to have that ability. God created you to have that ability. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. From my earliest days, I was privileged to have parents that instructed me in the way of the Lord and that father of mine against my own will many times pounded that into my head because he knew what was best I didn't want family altar they prayed around the world and here we were kneeling the five of us mother and dad and my brother and sister but you see he was carrying out what God, the purpose for which God created him. And that's what the word says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from thence. If you will follow through and instruct your children in the way of God as a father, God put it in your heart. Let it out of there. Turn it loose. Don't you let, don't you buy into the lies of the devil who's told you, well, I'm not a teacher. I, I'm not capable. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Shake your bony finger in Slewfoot's face. Say, look, I bought into your lies long enough. God created me to be an instructor to my children. Whew. Come on, don't get quiet now. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house, and upon thy gates. Hallelujah. Saturate that house of yours with the instruction of God's word. You say, well, Brother Trask, I've never been to Bible school. It doesn't say anything. Where does it say you've got to be to go to Bible school? It doesn't say that you have to. It's wonderful if you can. But just take the book and begin to read the book. That's the instructions in the book. That's the manual, you see. 
God created in his image, in his likeness, for the purpose of instruction. Number two, it's in your heart, it's in your heart to show love and compassion. Well, I'm not given to emotion. And uh, they know I love them. No, no. We were created in whose image? Whose image? God's image. Now, if God dealt with us like we deal with those, we'd be in tough shape. I said, we'd be in tough shape. Let me, let me say to you, God put in you, when he created you, the capacity and the ability to love and to show compassion. That may be fact. Now the key is to let it out. You say, but Brother Traska, I, 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 I'm just not made. Yes, you are made up that way. Don't you buy into that junk. You are created in the likeness and in the image of an almighty God who shows us love and compassion day by day by day by day, day after day after day after day. And if we will allow that spirit of an almighty God to flow in us, we can win this world for Jesus Christ. No question about it. Hallelujah. But it's got to start at home first. I said, it's got to start at home. Your children need to know that you can put your arms around them. My 22-year-old son, who's just finishing college, stopped by the house. This is what, Wednesday night? Monday night, when I got in from California. I put my arm around him. And, kissed him on the cheek and said, Tom, it's Tom the second. I love you, Tom. He kissed me back. He said, Dad, I love you. That isn't, that isn't uh, feminist. That's God. I said, that's God in you being expressed that is the creative work of God. He didn't give this responsibility to angels. He's given it to men, Holy Ghost men full of the spirit of an almighty God. So get, don't you again buy in to the, what the enemy has tried to steal from you. I gotta, be the, I gotta be the macho man in the house. We don't need any macho men in the house. We need men of love and compassion. Look at the prodigal son story. The boy had taken his dad's inheritance, the portion that he had come to him. And went out and squandered it amongst the swine. One day he wakes up in the pig pen. I said, what in the world am I doing here anyway? Eating, eating the husks with the pigs. These, the, the lowest of creatures. Miserable creatures. Smelly creatures. Ornery creatures. Here I am. I'm going back home. And the dad could have said, now look, I've had enough of this kid. I've given him all I'm going to give him. But what you see there is a picture of God the Father. Created in the image, we are created in his image. He stands and he looks on down the road. And, hallelujah. He was out there one day. I, I believe, you can believe it as you want. If you don't, that's a, no big deal. Fall out with me if you like. He, he looks down the road and he said, I believe you went there every day. If only my boy would come home. If only my boy would come home. If only my boy would come home. Forget the inheritance. Who cares about it? You can't take it with you anyway. Goes out there and stands in the porch one day. He looks down that dusty road and here comes this disheveled, shuffling emaciated piece of humanity a mess a mess he wasn't the robust athletic boy that had left home 
Sin, let me tell you, sin will always take you to its dreads. It'll, it'll bury you in that pit of slime and mess. The father said, that's my boy. He runs out and he embraces him and says, thank God you come home. And he kisses him. Why not? And he said, get, the, get, get a Hart Schaffner and Mark suit for this boy. He looks better in Hart Schaffner and Mark's than he does in Walmart. <laughs> Put a ring on his finger. He's my boy. And I'm going to, we're going to have a celebration. He's home. Hallelujah. Now let me tell you, that's the spirit of Christ. That's God the Father. I said, that's God the Father. Not this, but I've written him off. He's done. Get him out of here. Let me tell you, you'll never win the world with that kind of a spirit. God created you with the spirit. To, I want to embrace the world. Let me embrace the world. Let me show the love of Jesus Christ to a world. That's how he created you. Let it out. I said, let it out. Let it happen in your life. Number three. It's in your heart to forgive. I had a preacher say to me the other day, he's had a tragedy happen in his home. His, his youngest boy was in the ministry. And uh, three beautiful boys, stair steps. And... Uh, some Romeo came into the church and captured the heart of his wife. And just, she threw everything to the wind and left him. And it's so, it's so devastated, this father and mother, assemblies of God. He said to me, he said, Brother Trask, he said, I don't know if I can forgive her. He's lost his ministry. They've lost their mother. I don't know if I can forgive her. I said, uh, I understand. I really don't because I've never been there. But let me tell you something. God has put it in your heart to forgive. When you've tapped the end of your resources... That's not the end of his resources. And I don't know how many of you men in this auditorium tonight have had a tragedy in your marriage or your home. And you're saying, Brother Travis, I, I just can't forgive. Yes, you can. Because when you were created in the likeness and the image of God, God put it inside of you. It may be buried someplace. You might have suppressed it. And it might be down deep inside in some deep corner of your life. But I promise you, I'm the authority of God's divine word. It's in there. It's in there. God gives to you the ability to be free for unforgiveness. What a freedom there is in that. Because he forgave you. He said, if we forgive those who forgive us, and as our Heavenly Father forgave us, so must we forgive them. Read it in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Even as your Heavenly Father hath forgiven you, so forgive. It's in your heart. Now, the hardest thing for men to say is this, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I love you. You can't do that. Now, let me tell you, that's not, that's not God. That's flesh. You understand the difference? I said, that's flesh. 
That's, that's self. And if you live to please self, you'll, you'll exemplify that and you'll live out that. Well, I'm not going to tell her I'm wrong. I'm sorry. I've pastored enough years and counseled enough that I'm absolutely convinced if it wasn't for this lousy pride business that caused the angel to be thrown out of heaven and it's pride that gets in the heart of men, I'm not going to admit I'm wrong. I've said I'm wrong too enough. Now it's her time. And the devil uses that wedge and just drives that, drives it, drives it. Pretty soon it's all over with. Now let me tell you something. That spirit is not of God. I said, that spirit is not of God. The spirit of God that's inside of you is the spirit that has the ability to be able to forgive. Fact. Let me look in number four. God has given to you the spirit to provide. Not the best, but to the best of your ability. Now the scripture says, they that measure themselves among themselves are unwise. So don't worry about the Joneses in first assembly that have it. Doesn't mean a thing. To whom much is given, much is responsible. That's all, that's all that means. But God has put it within your heart and in your life and in your spirit the ability and the desire to provide. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 8, But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now that's the book. Now, let me tell you something, men. Live, live with satisfaction and contentment. Contentment with godliness is what? Great gain. Now, you're going to have to get off the treadmill the world is on because that's where they're at. The world's philosophy is the more you get, the more you want, the more you want, the more you uh, want, and you, can, you get on that, and you, it just goes over and over, and it's just, it's a rat race. And the church and the believer and the man are, were never meant to be on that treadmill. But to provide for his own. Now let me just put it in here because it, it is absolutely critical. You can't expect God to bless you, men, if you don't tithe. I, can't, I cannot for the life of me figure this thing out. Why men and women, but men, the household, head of the household, would not see the wisdom of tithing. God said, you give me 10%, 10 I'll let you keep 90%, and I'll bless you so your 90% will go more than 100%. Now, you don't have to be a mathematician or a space scientist to figure that out. And I've watched, I've watched it over the years. I've watched those. I was telling the crowd on a Sunday night there in Fremont uh, First Assembly. I had a deacon in the church right after I had accepted this pastorate. And they had warned me that he was um, going to divorce his wife. And uh, so I hadn't been there long. And he came to me wealthy. He said, uh, Pastor, he said, I'm going to divorce my wife. I said, now let me tell you something. He was the deacon. He was the song leader. He was the soloist and was good. I mean, good. He could bring that congregation into a place that God was phenomenal. But I said, let me tell you something. Now, if you do, 
Number one, you're not entitled to divorce because she's not been unfaithful to you. She has mothered your children. She wants this marriage. She's endeavoring to make it work. And you, you have gotten out of sorts with God and out of sorts with her. And if you do that, I will strip you of your deaconship, of your leadership, and of your soul. You'll never sing again as long as I'm pastor. He thought I was, he, he thought I was kidding him. So he did. He divorced her. And I took away his deaconship. He never led song service again and never sang solos in the church. And he never tithed. He, this, this, and he never tithed. He made big money. He never tithed. He put tokens in, bus tokens in the offering. <laughs> now let me tell you something. God, will, God knows how to extract it from him. His first marriage cost him a half a million. She took him for a half a million. The second marriage cost him 350000 The second wife took him for 350000 it. You can pay a lot of tithe with 850000 bucks. <laughs> now, we, we smile at that, but let me tell you, you don't, you don't violate God's word. I say, you don't violate God's word. God has put it within your heart for you to provide, and he's given you a plan. If you follow that plan, his blessing will rest upon you. He will open the windows of heaven and pour you out blessing so you cannot contain. He'll dump heaven and earth upon you. Hallelujah. That's the word of God. You can go to your bank tomorrow morning on that. That's the promise of God. It's, nothing, it's not complicated. It is not a, a, a formula. It's as simple as God's eternal word, you say. Number five. What time is it? He, God has put it within your heart to discipline. God has put it within your heart to discipline. Now, my father believed in the stars and stripes. He gave me the stripes and I saw the stars. I'm ashamed to tell you. I'm ashamed to tell you this. But the last trouncing, he called it trouncing. You don't hear those. That expression. How many, any of you remember those? Trouncing. It was a licking, but it was a super licking. I was 16 years of age, cocky, smart aleck, rebellious, running from God, and uh, going to high school, was working, came in the house, and Dad said, uh, Tom, um, what are you doing with your money? Well, I said, uh, you spend your money the way you want, and I'll spend my money the way I want. Yeah. Who was right? He came at me. I mean, he worked. He said, I'll beat you. You won't walk. And I haven't walked since. <laughs> no. But I'll tell you what he did. He drove that cockiness out of me. I said, he drove that cockiness out of me. And he, let, he said, as long as you set your feet under my table, I'm going to tell you, you're going to do as I say. You're going to come in when I say for you to come in. You're going to do as I tell you to do. And there's no questions asked. That was the turnaround in my life. You know why? Because the book says that. Spare the rod. And you'll what? Spoil the child. Now the scripture says every one that he loveth, he does what to? He chasteneth. He disciplines us. How many know we need discipline? Sure we do. I don't like it. You don't like it. But it's good for us. I said it's good for us. At least it's good when it stops hurting. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 19, verse number 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope. This Mr. Spock, this weirdo that wrote the books. And then in his last years of his life, he said, I made a mistake. After he ruined a generation or two, 
he now he wants to write another book. He writes another book how, how it should have been done, but it's so messed up that that's society. Now let me tell you something, man. God created us in his likeness and in his image. And it is in your heart to discipline. You say, Brother Trask, my wife does the discipline. It's not her responsibility to discipline. It's your responsibility to discipline. Not in anger. I said not in anger. The word tells us that. He said, don't you do that in anger. Don't make it hard. You, you see, in the Assemblies of God, there were years gone by when we, we let this pendulum swing so far to the left. I was raised in, in a churches that uh, the, the uh, people of the church made it so hard. The kids didn't want anything to do with God. Now, let me tell you something. You can discipline, but they can know that it's fun to serve Jesus. Come on. It was never, never, never in the plan and the purpose of God for us to lose our children to the world. I was with Pastor Terry Inman Sunday night, Pastor Cole. Seven pastors, first of seven, seven boys from what probably uh, 28 to 13 all of them were in church sunday night all serving jesus love it i said to terry man i salute you now don't let let me tell you something don't let the devil put his cleats into you when you and your wife have been faithful and done the what's right and your son or your daughter is not serving god you stick your finger in his bony face and say look devil you might have them for a while, but we, we prayed over that son and daughter. We have dedicated them to Jesus Christ, and they might be outside the fold, but you don't have them for long. They belong to God. They're, belo they're God's property. Take your hands off them. There's God's. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to know you need to have some courage. Stand up to them. Don't let them push you around. I'm tired of that. I said, I'm tired of man being pushed around by the devil lied to. Sold a bill of goods. Well, we got to accept it. You don't have to accept that. It's not in the book. Here's the manual. Number six. It's in your heart to be the spiritual head of the home. When he created you and me, he created us to be the spiritual head. In his likeness. Who's the head of the church? God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, the Holy Ghost. They have not forfeited that authority and that headship to a secondary power. And you dare not do that. Now it's in there. It's in you. It's in you because he created you that way. The key is to let it out and to let God work through you and in you so that you have the joy of fulfilling the design that God created you for. Simple as that. You see, there's nothing worse than to live with guilt. I said, there's nothing worse than to live with guilt. Knowing truth and not living out truth. Knowing truth and not doing truth. That's why this scripture said, be not hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. You see. Lead the family in worship. 
lead the family. I, when I was pastoring, regularly I would conduct a family worship course for the men of the church so they would know what to do. It, it's, it's not a big deal. Just gather the family together, open the Word of God, take some version that the children can understand. Don't read over there in Hezekiah. Read the genealogy. Stay away from that stuff. You don't understand it, either do I. <laughs> Start over there in the book of Proverbs. Billy Graham reads uh, for years, has read five chapters out of the book of Proverbs every day and a chapter out of the book of Psalms. The Proverbs uh, helps him, he said, to relate to his fellow man. The Psalms relates to his, to his God. That's good instruction. Sure. So read it. That's a marvelous book. Tells you what to do and what not to do. He says if you commit adultery, you're going to live with that shame the rest of your life. Read it over there in chapter 6. You will never get away from the scar of that. That will put some thinking in your head. So read it. That's what it says. Sit down with them and then just simply say, look, that dad, dad wants to pray for you. I never remember leaving for school without having mom and dad pray for us. All those years. And we, in our own home, we've done that. It takes, sure, it takes discipline. But God's put it inside of you. I said, God's put that inside of you. To be the spiritual head of the home. And the enemy will do everything in his power to keep you from fulfilling that responsibility. Because if he can do that, he's got a foothold in that home of yours. Let me say that again. I said the enemy will do everything in his power to keep you from fulfilling this spiritual headship of that home. Because if he can, he will have a foothold in that home of yours. So don't let him have it. You sang the chorus a few moments ago, I've take back what the enemy stole from me. Go out there in the very front line, start in your home and say, look, for me and my house, we're going to serve God. We're going to serve Jesus Christ. I'm going to be the man that God created me to be. I've been made in the likeness of an almighty God. Hallelujah. Now I must close. How can I fulfill all this? You can't do it in yourself. I said, you can't do it in yourself. God never expected you to do it in yourself. That's why he's given to us his spirit, his Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, And ye shall receive power, 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 after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Now let me tell you something. The reason why the assemblies of God went into a flat and, well, let me say it, decline, is because we moved away from the emphasis upon the power of the Holy Spirit. And we'd get people saved at our altars and we'd say to them, go out and try and live for Jesus. And they live amongst this vile, wicked, filthy, rotten, vomiting world of ours today. And we, but we never tell them that there's a power available to them. The power of the Holy Ghost. For ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. After. Say it with me. After. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. To be. Read it. Acts 1.8. To be. You see, God is more concerned with what we are than what we say. Anybody can mouth this thing. We got people that have learned to mouth it. But what God is looking for today are men and women that can live it. And he said, I will give you my Holy Spirit, and my Holy Spirit will empower you to be, to be the child of God, to be the man that I want you.
want you to be. I will empower you to do that. So it isn't living in your power. You're living in his power. You see. See the difference? Some of these, of course, I pastored there in Detroit for a number of years. And some of these Detroit iron they're putting out. Little tiny. These little Mickey Mouse engines they got in these things. They don't have enough power to hardly to pull the thing down the road. Give me these eight-cylinder jobbies. <laughs> Give me turbocharge. So when you hit it, brother, that thing responds to you. I want you to know God is giving some turbocharge to the church of Jesus Christ. It's the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it's for you. And the purpose for that turbocharge is so that you can live out the likeness of the image of God. See how simple that is? So when you go to that ungodly shop and those men begin to vomit out that filth, you're able to walk away and say, Hallelujah. My ears are not garbage cans. Jesus lives inside of me. Greater is he that's inside of me than he that's within the world. I don't have to buckle because I buckle on the breastplate of righteousness. And I'm living in the power of the Holy Ghost. And there's an anointing. I said there comes an anointing. For the yoke shall be broken because of the anointing. I like what Pastor said a few moments ago. There's enough men in this room that can literally change the assemblies of God. I believe that. Men full of the Holy Ghost. Men anointed. Men living out the image and the likeness of God. So when you go back home to your church, when you walk down the aisle Sunday morning to take the offering, they'll say, what in the world has happened to that guy? He's, he's, got, he's got a sheen, not because you're bald-headed like I am either, but he's got a sheen on his face that radiates the glory of God. Hallelujah. I want you to know the Father has that glorious sheen. Hallelujah. He said he couldn't stand to look upon him for the glory of God. He wants to pour into you men tonight. To lift you out of the failure. You know, it's easy, it's easy in this kind of an atmosphere, isn't it? Huh? Wonderful. Man, you, if, you can't, if you can't feel this, your feeler's dead. But this is not the test in Brownsville. It's when you get back home. It's when you have to face a rebe rebellious child. It's when you have to face some difficulties. Then what happens? Let me tell you, the same likeness is there. It isn't something that comes and goes, man. You were created. He made you. He molded you. He shaped you. You got his fingerprints. You got his fingerprints all over you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he said, I did it so that they can live in this 20th century, this last year, of ninth, this 20th century, regardless of what has happened in the world. They can do it because my power is within them. Father, I thank thee for thy Holy Spirit. He to be like
like Jesus to be like Jesus all I ask is to be like him all through life's journey from earth to glory all I ask is to be like I want you to stand with me, please. To be like Jesus. All I ask is to be like him all through life's journey from earth to glory all I ask is to be With every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to open these altars, first of all, for men, backslidden men, backslidden men, prodigals, prodigals. I'm going to open this altar for men who have never, who have never accepted Jesus. But I want God has spoken to you. I said, the Holy Spirit has brought conviction to your heart. I want you to step out from where you are standing. Possibly everybody here is a, a Christian. I don't know that, but it's not, for, it's not for me to assume that. You're here tonight, sinner or backslider. You've come to this conference away from God. I want you to come and kneel at an altar, an old-fashioned altar. So we sing it together. Heads bowed, men praying to be like Jesus. From the balconies, Jesus. All I ask, come kneel at an altar. I need some altar workers, please. Like he. All through all I ask is to be like him to be like Jesus to be like Jesus all I ask is that your prayer like him all through life's journey from earth to glory all I ask is to be like now hear me carefully men we're going to anoint you with oil that God would give you a fresh anointing some of you have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit you need the Holy Spirit you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit 
You need that power in your life. And the scripture says, when you do, you will speak with other tongues as the Spirit. You say, Brother Trask, how will I know when I get the baptism? Because you'll speak in other tongues. It's not something you learn. We, we don't teach you. The Bible says, out of the innermost being, it will flow rivers of living water. I'm going to ask these in the platform to, we're going to station ourselves at these aisles. Leadership. Pastors out there, I need your help. Pastors, if you'll come. And we're going to at, we're going to stand at the end of these aisles. And we're going to anoint you with oil. And I want you to get into the aisle if you want to be anointed. And you're going to wait. Just stand there so, we're going to, so our people get there. And we're going to anoint you with oil. And when they anoint you with oil, I want you to believe for the Holy Ghost to come upon you. And if you are in bondage, I said, if you're in bondage, you need for the, oh, the Spirit to break that. The yoke shall be broken because of the anointing. And then find a place of prayer into the choir loft. You want to lay in your face before God, that's okay. But don't you leave this conference until you've been set free by the power of God, till there's a fresh anointing upon your life, till that you've been endued with the power of God so you can live in the likeness of Jesus Christ, live out the image of God created you for and the purpose of which God created you. Sing with me together. So raise your hands, you that are in the aisles waiting to come. Slip up your hand. It can happen for you even before you get to the altar. Even before you get to these who anoint you with oil. To be like Jesus. To be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.